We're going to do trading transactions now. We're going to trade in an old asset that you have for a suit in your asset. And this um, example is in your study guide on page 81. So let's have a look what the transaction is all about. A company, which is Coolcat, owned a Ford Bantam bucket, a pickup that was purchased on 1 January 2009 for 136,800. Um, we are working with a VAT rate of 14%. So that was the amount that I've paid for the bucket. So after we've removed that, the amount actually VAT exclusive was 120,000. It is the company's accounting policy to depreciate such delivery vehicles over a period of four years with no residual value. On 31 December 2012, at the end of the bucket's useful life, the company did a trade in of the Ford Bantam for a new Chevrolet Corsa bucket. The purchase price of the Chevrolet Corsa was 159600 and obviously that includes VAT. Coolcat issued a cheque of 102600 to the Chevrolet dealer in respect of the transaction. Provide the journal entries to record the trading transaction as of 31 December 2012. Amounts include VAT of 14%. Now whenever you get a trading transaction, please don't get confused. There are actually two transactions that comes to play which you have to record. The first transaction is the old asset that you have to remove out of your books. You've sold the old asset. You do not, don't own that old asset anymore. And you're going to do that exactly in the same way that what you're going to do with a normal sales transaction. The other transaction that you have to record is the new um, asset that was purchased. And you're going to record the new asset as a if it was any normal asset that you're going to record for the first time. So although the one asset was traded in for the another asset, it is a related transaction, but totally, totally independent from each other. So if we're going to go and have a look at the old Fortum Bucky, then the question that you have to ask yourself is, number one, did I use the Bucky in the current year? If the answer is yes, then you have to make provision for depreciation. But they give you, they told you here that at the end of December, the date of the trading transaction, end of the buck is used for life, the company did a trade in for the new one. So that means that that full amount there was depreciated at the date of the trading transaction, or if you want to then the date of the sales transaction, because the trading is nothing else than a sales transaction. So what do we have to do? We have to remove that asset out of our box. So we're going to credit the vehicles at cost price. At, and remember, the cost price of the vehicle will be the VAT exclusive price. So the VAT exclusive price of that asset, 136,800 divided by 1.14, 120,000. So I credit the asset account with 120,000. I will debit my asset disposal account or asset realization account with 120,000. If the asset was fully depreciated, which it will be at the end of its useful life, and there was no residual value, so the value um, of the accumulated depreciation at this point of time will be equal to the value of the cost price of the asset. So I'm going to debit the accumulated depreciation of 120000 and I'm going to credit my asset disposal account, the asset realization account, with 120000 so now the cost price is there and the accumulated depreciation is there. How much did we receive for this old asset? Now they've told us that the new asset costed 159,600, but we only paid 102,600 for that asset. So the difference between the 159,600 and the 102,600 gives us a net amount of 57,000. So strictly speaking, if these two transactions were not related to each other at all, you would have given the dealer a check for 159,600. Now you only issued a check for 102,600. So by implication, it means that the difference between those two amounts is the amount that you received for the old Ford Bucky that you have traded in. So that's the proceeds. Now, we are going to debit now the Chevrolet dealer, which in this case could be either debtor or creditor, 
whatever at this point of time it's a debtor but then when we purchase the new buck it's going to um, tr transform into a creditor so we're going to debit the dealer's account with the amount that he actually gave us for the old vehicle which is 57,000 remember that included in that amount is VAT so the VAT we have to pay over to the receiver of revenue so the VAT portion included the 7,000 rand will be credited against my VAT output account then the net amount 50,000 that is the amount that we're going to take to our asset disposal account 50,000 now there's a debit of 120,000 and a credit of 120,000 in the asset disposal account so in order to clear the asset disposal account we're going to debit that account With what? With the proceeds that belongs to us, 50,000 Rand. And what are we going to credit? We're going to credit then profit on disposal of the vehicle to balance off the account with 50,000 Rand. So the full amount that we have received for that asset will be a profit because the asset was carried in our books at a zero value and then i'm done with the old asset totally separately from that i'm going to do the new asset now so the purchase price of the new asset was a 159 600 i'm going to remove the vat so i'm going to debit my cost price of my vehicles with 140,000, the vat exclusive amount i can claim the vat on what? On the invoice price. What is the invoice price of the new asset? The invoice price of the new asset was 159,600. So I can claim 19,600 Rand on that invoice. And then the dealer, I owe the full invoice amount of 159,600. The question says that I've issued a check of 102,600 Rand to the dealer. Now, just before we have issued the check, what is the balance of the dealer's account? There was a debit of 57,000. Here is a credit of a 159,600 credit debit. So what was the balance in the Chevrolet dealer's account? 102,600. And now we're going to settle the bill. So we're going to debit this account with 102,600. And he, his account is going to have a zero balance and we're going to credit our bank with 102,600 rand. And then we're done. The next thing that we want to look at is disclosure of property, plant and equipment in our statement of financial position. Now, according to IAS 16, we have to write a note on property, plant and equipment. For each clause of non-current asset that we possess they must be in the note not on the face of the statement of financial position in the notes it must be a separate column and in that column we have to provide the reader of the financial statements with some information the first thing is that we have to show him the carrying amount as at the beginning of the current financial period and that carrying amount we have to split between what was the cost price of all these type of assets that we have, all the asset classes, plus the accumulated depreciation of each and every class of non-current asset in our possession. Then that's the first section of the note. The second section of the note is all the movements that took place in the current financial period. So in the current financial period, what happened? We have bought some new assets, and if we did, we will show all the additions of new assets at the cost price. We could have disposed of some of our existing assets, and if we did, we will show the disposals at carrying amount. Now, we'll come back to that one now again. And the third one that we're going to show is our total depreciation charge per class asset for the current financial period. Now, that depreciation that we see there, that depreciation is, um, or that is going to be the total depreciation per class item, irrespective of the fact that a certain amount of that depreciation charge will belong to an item that we have disposed of 
during the course of the year. Now I have to show the disposals at carrying amount because if we're going to downcast this calculation, we must balance back to the carry value of our assets on hand at the end of the financial period. So the third section is about the carry value at the end of the financial period, again broken up in cost price and accumulated depreciation. Now if the total depreciation on assets disposed of is lying in that figure, and that figure is a net amount, in other words the carrying amount of the depreciation has been deducted, it means I will never ever ever balance back to the carry value of assets at the end of the year if my disposals are not taken out at carrying a value. That is carrying value, additions at cost, that is cost, but once I've uh, put down the depreciation on the new assets, which is included in the depreciation figure, I will show my additions at carrying value for the year as well. Disposals must be at carrying value because then carrying value, carrying value, carrying value will at the end of the day equal carrying value. So therefore, disposals at the carrying value. You also have to list uh, uh, all the land and buildings that belongs to you. Now, large companies which owns a lot of buildings or a lot of land or a lot of property usually attach an annex share to this financial statement where they give these particulars of all the land and buildings that they own. So let's assume we only have one property. And you will say land and buildings consist of F212 Potter of Stream Northwest and is held under the title D212 stroke 195. If any of your assets was pledged against as security against a loan, you must mention the fact. You must also mention the fact at what loan did it uh, actually uh, counts as a security, and was it pledged for security for, and then there must be a cross-reference from this note to that note, in this case the long-term loan, so that whenever the user is reading the long-term no loan note, which we're still going to do, he must be able to go back to his property plant and equipment note and see, oh dear, yes, vehicles, vehicles were all pledged as a security for the long-term loan. What happens if some of our, of our assets, our non-current assets, was damaged in some kind of event which led to an insurance claim? Our averaging clause, like I've said, is exactly the same. It will be the insured amount against the value, uh, divided by the value of the asset multiplied by the value of the loss of the asset that was damaged. Exactly the same as with insurance. Now, the value of those assets, it's immovable assets, it's property, plant and equipment, is usually insured at the replacement value of those assets. So movable assets like vehicles and equipment is usually insured at the market value of that asset. So if I have a building, I will insure myself against the value what it will cost to rebuild that same building. If I have a delivery vehicle, which is a movable asset, if I want to replace that same vehicle, I need the market value of that asset because that is what I will buy if I'm going to replace that asset in the marketplace. The accounting treatment. Now, the total loss of property, plant and equipment is treated similarly to the disposal of an asset. So you're going to dispose of the asset in a normal way. The only difference is now that the proceeds that you're going to receive on this asset will be the value of the insurance claim that you've lodged. So if the insurance claim value is bigger than the carrying amount, you will make a gain with the disposal. Because why? The proceeds is more than the carrying amount, therefore it's a profit. If the value that you're going to get by way of the insurance claim is less than the car uh, carrying amount, then you've made a loss on the disposal. Now, um, if part of the PPE item is damaged and requires repairs, the portion of the damage that is not recoverable from the insurer is treated as an expense which is only repairs, and it will go to an expense account. That is a normal expense account. Oopsie. And then I will debit my expense account. I will debit my insurer.
and I will credit bank with the amount that you're going to receive. VAT. A registered VAT vendor must account for VAT output if an indemnity payment is received from an insurer. Same with inventory. We said if I can lodge a claim of 115 Rand, I'm going to receive 115 Rand. But remember that 15 Rand belongs to the insurer or to the receiver of revenue. So therefore the VAT output will be credited with 15 Rand. And only the amount of proceeds that I'm entitled on will be the VAT exclusive amount. Guys, that's everything that you should know about PPE.